So, okay, we should be recording now. Um, first of all, welcome everyone to First Tuesdays. Uh, as has already been mentioned a couple of times, this is our inaugural uh, Zoom webinar outing. So please forgive any bugs. Uh, we'll work through them as quickly as possible. Our normal moderator is uh, Nono Berling, but she is not here today. Uh, instead, we have the wonderful Elizabeth Ayukia that I, I can't pronounce your name today at all, Elizabeth. I'm sorry. <laughs> Jeremy, you've worked with me for almost I know, 12 years. It's just not enough Seriously. coffee. Not enough coffee. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so Elizabeth is here joining us in uh, Nono's stead. Uh, I am here as technical support, Jeremy Stroud, uh, as well as Joe Olivar. Welcome, Joe. Thank you. Um, and we'll put our information in chat in case you run into any issues. And uh, lastly, this session is brought to you by the Secretary of State and the Institute of Museum and Library Services. So, um, Elizabeth, I'll let you go ahead and do the bio while Jane loads up her slides. Right. So this morning we have the pleasure to bring to you, um, and I'm going to put your uh, Jane's surname. Wow. Oh, right. I'll get it for you. Lots of flashing going on here on the screen. <laughs> it's just it is. distracting. <laughs> Rizika Majdi. Right, right. So Jane Rizika Majdi. Um, Jane's been an elementary school teacher's librarian since 2004. During that time, she's actually been employed at three different school districts. Uh, prior to becoming a teacher librarian, she was employed by the Pierce County Library System, where I actually worked with her spouse um, ages ago. Uh, it was while she was working at Pierce County Library that she decided to get her MLS and her teaching certificate. In addition to those uh, laudable credentials, she has a bachelor's degree in business and an associate's degree in accounting. So no surprise that she's involved with STEM education because she has a very varied background. Uh, during her free time, she manages their Icelandic sheep farm, uh, which is comprised of 13 acres and roughly 60 sheep at the moment. Um, a few more things about Jane. She loves to garden, spend time outdoors, paint, cook, and make ham creams and personal care products. She had her first foray into gym making this summer, so we can tell that she's a very adventurous, lifelong learner. Um, Eight batches of jam, each consisting of eight cups of berries. I'm very interested in this next part. Um, her blueberries are ripe, but being eaten by her little puppy. Um, and she's got black currants and apples, and made clippings this year of the black currants and red gooseberry last fall. So um, I'm going to have to be super nice to Jane so I can maybe get some of those cuttings at some point. <laughs> I know Jane because she's actually uh, received a grant from the Washington State Library, one of our digital literacy grants, and hosted an awesome um, elementary school engineering event that uh, I had the pleasure to attend and was amazed by the level of participation, all the kids and parents actively engaged in uh, STEM activities. So she's obviously very good at sneaking in fun to learning. So. Um, I'm very excited to hear Jane's presentation today. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, and I'm going to be talking to you today about implementing different STEM programs and specifically about the different ones that I've implemented over the past five to six years. And hopefully you'll find one or two that fit your time constraints and your comfort level. In this picture here on the slide on the um, left corner is one of my activities that I tried last year at the beginning of the school year with my intermediate grades. And it was an activity, I did a search on Pinterest, it was a, a search under like STEM hands-on activities. Uh, as you can see, it is a simple one to take and put together. It consists of yarn and one of the three ring binders a plastic cup, the kind that you see at Costco, and a tennis ball. And um, so it, it was really an activity to build teamwork as a whole class before we eventually worked into small groups and then with a partner throughout the year. But um, it opened up the discussion of what is teamwork and the need to have everybody really giving their effort into the activity. And so the, the way this starts is the yarn is all on the floor and the students have to choose a leader to take and guide them and they all have to raise the, first just the cup up in the air without it falling off of the ring. 
and then if they're successful, then they can try with the tennis ball. Um, this class was successful. Some of the classes weren't. It took them two, two uh, classes to do it, but it, then afterwards we could evaluate what worked really well or what they needed to change to improve their teamwork. So this was one of the activities I just started at the beginning of the year, and it was really engaging, and they loved it. So some of the different programs that I'm going to talk about today are, I'm the library media specialist, so I work in the library, and in the library I've done Makerspace, and I've also done um, integration into my curriculum with STEM activities. And then school-wide, I've done the half-day events, the student and families, which is the one that Elizabeth was referring to with my technology and engineering emphasis. Um, and that one was a really fun one to do. And then I've also done an all-day celebration at the end of my um, school year. So the district-wide one that Elizabeth referred to was across schools. So it involved elementary, middle school, and high schools. And then, of course, funding is always one of those issues that we want to talk about. Um, and I've become very creative with funding. And so I've gotten a name throughout the district that um, is associated with getting donations and funding and grants. So hopefully I'll have some tips to give you on that one. So the key is with a STEM program is really setting a vision for it, because otherwise it's hard to focus on how you want to take and have your programs or funding um, spent. And, and so my focus was on coding skills for students because by the time that our students graduate from high school, most of the job careers are going to take and involve some sort of coding skills. Um, you know, whether it's, it's medical, computer, it, it's just going to be out there. And so my thought was, that kids at the elementary level, they're like a sponge and they're, you know, quick learners. And so if I start coding at the elementary level, by the time they start moving into middle school and high school, they can keep building on this foundation and they won't be intimidated by, um, you know, terms such as computer science thinking, oh boy, I don't think I can do that. That sounds really hard or I don't know what that is. So everything that I do has um, a coding emphasis, whether I'm taking and planning events, I try to include a lot of the coding, or whether I'm making purchases for my makerspace and STEM activities, they're really focused on coding. Um, and that, that really has made a huge difference for me because then I'm not all over the board with my purchases and what to get. It kind of is more consistent. And then the next thing you need to do is decide what kind of program is going to work for you and how you're going to implement it. Um, the library or classroom is the easiest and least time consuming. And um, with that, I have the Makerspace. The Makerspace was new last year. And I was lucky when I moved into the library, I actually inherited a lot of um, my um, initial start for my makerspace. I got the dominoes and um, some of the Duplo blocks and and um, a couple other things that I've put into the makerspace and that works great with the younger kids. Um, and then I've used the makerspace this year with kindergarten and first grade as far as centers on a fairly consistent basis to help build social skills and it's more of a free form but I will oftentimes ask them to do specific things. With the older kids, I definitely integrate that into library lessons and ask them to take and build a bridge, for example, if it's sixth grade and we're working on ancient civilization so that they are working and making a connection to what they're learning. Um, and that is also something you can use as free time or during recess. And so that would work in a classroom or a library setting on that. And in the library, I also integrate into my lessons the um, STEM activities. It could be a school-wide event, a one-time event. Um, last year, the um, across district one was my first time that I did that. And um, 
that one is displayed here in the picture to the left. That would be, it was student led and um, my um, kiddos here are teaching, my elementary kiddos are teaching a pencil stack um, to other elementary kids at this point here and and it took place in the gym it could be the annual event which is my uh, I I go back and forth between steam and stem because um, I do include art in it so that's why I kind of put it as a steam at the end of the year but during the year stuff is usually stem um, so my annual one that one has taken place uh, the past five or six events and that's an all-day event um, where I have um, more of a community-led activity going on. And then you might want it at the district-wide level, um, and that would be like the across the school. What I would definitely recommend is starting small and growing your program. That's not what I did all around because I kind of started from um, the STEM activities that took a lot of planning. Um, but this is a picture of this past June's STEAM celebration. And what I wanted to show here was um, how it's grown because when I first started this program five years ago, I only had 16 community members um, that were involved. This year, it was up to 60 different businesses. And you'll see it's color coded we are really lucky at our school we have 17 acres so most of it took place outside but part of it was in our gym that's the purple part and under the play shed um, and those were because they needed Wi-Fi or the electrical um, hookup for 3d machines um, or whatever they were doing but they needed to have that access inside and what I do typically with this one is I'll have the um, I have it so that the morning is really for the intermediate and the afternoon is for the primary kids. And um, as they're going through, they are subdivided by smaller groups. And that's why I have the colors here is that they kind of have about 30 minutes in each section. And then the foghorn blows and they rotate to the next section um, and get to then look around. So it's kind of like when you go to, uh, I'd say, a fair or one of those. Um, festivals that you have a lot of booths and they get to go and spend as little or as much time at each booth as they want. Um, so so this is just that general picture um, and this one is very labor intensive um, but it's that's what it's become here. So, so hardly any to some time. Um, this past year, I was on the invited to join the district committee for elementary schools to work on um, the STEM implementation. We, we were asked to evaluate different databases to see which databases we felt would be the most effective um, to support our new um, science kits that are STEM related. And then we got introduced to workshops and other people in our district that were interested in STEM and webinars, and we got to look at new STEM products and try things out. The high school uh, had made a 3D microscope that you could put on a, um, a phone, and so we get to play around with that. Um, but it was, it was fun. It wasn't a huge time commitment. It was really about 10 meetings that were about two and a half hours apiece. I'm sure your districts have trainings for STEM, and if not, there are tons of workshops available out there. I know that, um, you know, Barnes & Noble has STEM activities going on. Public libraries have STEM activities. Uh, we had museums that were doing STEM activities, and they try to get um, parents and students. Also, you know, they have um, fun activities for just to, to really get everybody involved in STEM. And then once again, the maker space. And, that is not really labor intensive. As I said, I inherited most of my makerspace stuff, but this year I did spend a good portion of my PTO budget on makerspace activities and um, got that organized. On the right side of the screen is another activity that I got off of Pinterest. 
And um, what the students had to do is they were given a planning sheet that's that white piece of paper at the bottom near the scissors. And they first had uh, five minutes to plan um, how they could make the longest paper chain. And they were only going to be given one piece of paper, um, masking tape, paper clips, scissors, and stapler. And they had a time limit of 10 minutes. And so during the planning phase, they were required to take in and um, each, you know, give their ideas and then decide what was going to be the best course of action. And hopefully when they were doing that, they also realized that they needed to give out jobs to each person. And this group, as you can see, is all actively engaged in making the chain. They've almost gotten to the end of it and everybody is doing something in this process. And it was a fun activity because they got a chance to discuss what a chain was and make sure that they understood what a, the definition of a chain was because if they didn't, they could get sidetracked. And then at the end of 10 minutes, they laid them out alongside each other to see which chain was the longest and they talked about the things that worked and the things that didn't and what they would need to change next time, which is kind of your engineering cycle to take and plan, build, you know, take and make adjustments and changes and then present. Some to medium time. Um, as a librarian, I um, teach library lessons, um, but I found that it's really easy to integrate the STEM into the library lessons because whenever I do websites or apps, I can easily teach um, how to cite a website. I can teach taking notes or um, evaluating websites or apps. And so those are some of the lessons that I, you know, teach and focus on with my students, uh, especially in the intermediate level. And I found that at least when we're doing stuff that they're actively engaged in, uh, they're really excited about doing the lesson and applying it to the STEM. Um, this year I've worked really closely with our Tech TOSA for the elementary schools and she's been great about adding websites and apps to uh, our school web page. I had a link on this, this um, PowerPoint but I don't have any more so if anybody is, is interested um, for our East Olympia Elementary School homepage there's um, technology links and and that one has some great information and websites if you're looking to add websites or apps that um, you might want to use with your programs um, but I said to her on several occasions hey you know I've I said I heard about Nearpod but I don't really understand how to use it and I'd forgotten about it um, can you show me how to do it and so she actually taught a lesson came in and taught a lesson and um, then I said to her, well, I'm going to repeat the lesson with my next three uh, uh, third grade classes because I had four levels this year. And um, she came in, watched me reteach it, and helped me where I hadn't gotten the information the first time. And, and I found that it was a really effective way to have her come in and help me. And I didn't have to spend all of this time trying to get to learn a program where she could really make it so much smoother and easier of a transition. And it was the same way with the apps with her. One of the websites that I tried last year um, at the end of the year was Nearpod. And if you haven't used that, it's a really fun interactive classroom tool. And it's kind of like this webinar where um, I create the lesson. I either grab one that there already exists for free you can buy them as a district too. Um, or you can use a template to create your own lesson. So it's it would be great for math, you know, English review, whatever you're doing, you can fit it in with any topic. And um, it's interactive and engaging. And the cool thing is once you invite the kids into the website, you take and I then have control over their computers. So it's like I'm going through the PowerPoint and they're going with me and I can ask them questions. They can draw pictures. The questions can vary. It can be choose the best answer or um, write a response to a question, but I get instant feedback and so I can collect data and I can see who's responding and um, if they're getting the information or not, but if they're not, 
um, when I share, it doesn't share their name, only I can see their name. So that was something I did try and I definitely would recommend using that um, in, the, um, in your teaching setting. Guest speakers, last year we had an uncle who, of a student who was um, an engineer in bri bridge building and he brought in his virtual reality with his um, bridge building software and it was really neat because you know then it was like you were on top of the bridge and doing inspections and um, the kids really loved it and of course that was a free speaker that came in and um, worked with our sixth graders in particular um, with that and they once again they did their ancient civilization so it just piggybacked right into their learning um, but he also came back again at the end of the year for my STEAM, and he was also there mid-year for my um, across-district event for the technology engineering one. Hands-on activities, there were pictures that I showed you of the STEM activities that I found on Pinterest, um, but I also have them doing building, working with um, apps and other um, STEM-related uh, makerspace activity stuff that I purchase. So all of that is really some to medium time um, on that. One of the hands-on activities was um, the We Do kits that I got, the robotic kits with the iPads that I purchased with the Washington State Library Digital Literacy Funding. And um, that was a great activity because the kids got the hands-on robotics and they had to build a machine and then they presented after they coded in you know something for it to do so that was really fun for students a lot of time on the right here you'll see is a picture it says sunset air that's one of the businesses that does heating and cooling and they've created a robot out of their air duct systems um, but they have been at my stem celebration the past two years. Last year they did solar energy and so they did some solar um, STEM related activities. Um, and then the student parent event is also a lot of planning. Um, that one I, I really wanted to include the parents but have the emphasis be on the technology that we use, the websites and the apps that we use to help students um, take and continue growing with their STEM, with their coding and um, whatever we're doing in school. And so to give the parents that hands-on so that they could understand what their kids are doing and um, be more familiar with what we have. And then the district-wide event. The labor intensive programs, there's a lot of pros and cons. Um, the pro of building a, a great net, network and um, partnerships in the community. Not only did I get a, a better feeling for what um, the careers were of, of a lot of our students, um, so that's great to know because whenever you need a guest speaker, you have a program, um, oftentimes parents will love to come in for a one-time thing like this uh, and it's a fun activity for them and they can't always volunteer on a regular basis but this is a great option the networking you really have to work at building that up and and um, finding out what's out in the community because it's there is no list that says here this is what's available um, it's just making phone calls and asking and word of mouth and just kind of continuing to grow that network um, hands-on activities, games, information, and just, you know, being exposed to different careers. That's my main goal with the STEM because really that's the way that students are going to learn. And, um, and I think that just sparks interest in, in different possibilities that are out there. Communication skills. Um, I've increased my communication skills for, in email and donations requests um, and in telephone calls. Um, but I also have students who um, the past two years I've had them more involved with the planning stages of my STEM programs and I've had them actually make calls to 
um, local businesses to ask for donations and um, and take and um, you know ask them to come to be a volunteer at one of our events. And I do find they often have a harder time saying no to the students calling. So that was that kind of fell fell into um, my hands by a student just saying, you know, hey, I'd love to make some calls. Can I do that? And I said. Okay, so we practiced, you know, those skills of what he needed to say, and then after that, it, it's taken off, and and so that's great because they get real life skills. Some of the cons are the time commitment. When I first started with my more labor intensive programs, um, I had a lot more spare time in my schedule, but now I have a lot less because we've had a huge increase in our student population in the past year. It's just been um, uh, like a hundred students we had an increase of um, and then with going all day kindergarten you just I don't have the free time anymore that I that I had before um, so I ended up doing a lot of it from home on weekends and also that you can't please everyone that students and parents involved um, but to kind of keep in mind that um, as long as you have an aha moment or a light bulb moment for at least one student then I think that it's it's really worth um, doing the whole program and going through all of that. And issues will arise such as um, people will cancel out at the last minute and so I've learned to overbook and knowing that there's you know either somebody's quit a job or they're shorthanded at work or there's health issues whatever at long as long as you kind of pad in and accommodate for that, then you're not feeling like, oh, I don't have enough people um, and other things. <clears throat> the district-wide event, it took place in the gym. That's um, seen um, on the left photo there. I used the lunch tables or the floor, um, and in the back is where our music stage is, and that's where we had the robotics. But you can see this is um, well attended. We've got um, all ages here and this was during the afternoon still so it was uh, our student time and then after school let out we continued with parents thinking that if we did it during the let out session all of those parents who do parent pickup would then be able to easily come and see what's happening. And so it was a student-led one uh, from the elementary school um, to the middle school to the high school. My part in it was kind of getting my elementary school kids signed up to run stations and also having them come in e and practice either during recess or when they came to me for their weekly visit during the library so that they would practice how to take and teach other students um, on that. And so I did have a sign up sheet and I usually had at least two students teaching at the same station, sometimes three or four. Um, they got to interact with peers. The middle picture shows the high school. Um, one of our high schools does uh, building airplanes and it has the, he's looking at the plane simulator here. And that would be one of my um, sixth grade students that's um, interacting with um, the high school student. And on the far right is our robotics. Um, the boy that is kneeling is from the high school team and I taught him when he was in elementary. And they had just come back from um, winning their robotics championship. And it was really neat because on the stage then we had, uh, I have a dot and dash and I had the we do robotics. And then the middle school had their robotics and then the high school had their robotics team. And so all of the kids that looked at the robotics could see how you went from a more simple machine to, you know, more complex. And they got to take and talk to everybody and ask questions and find out about the middle school and high school programs. And it was a very fun event. The um, picture over here on the right shows one of my sixth graders who did the student-led activity for the dot and dash for the 
district-wide event that I just did on the last page was um, he would come in at recess and he taught himself how to do this. And um, then he would come in, he would get excused from class and come in in the afternoon and then present to my kindergarten, first and second grade classes so that he could kind of practice going through his speech. But he talked about what he found really hard to take and do. He would show them the iPad and demonstrate everything and um, then took questions at the end. Um, if you're feeling a little overwhelmed, you can view the TED Talk by, that should be Sugata, we're missing the A at the end of the T there, Mitra. Kids can teach themselves, otherwise um, known as a hole in the wall project. Um, and what he did was he took a computer monitor and a keypad and he put it in a building and that's all they had access to was the monitor and keypad. And he would go to slums and these communities that didn't have any education and he found that consistently the kids would within three hours to a day learn how to browse, how to send emails, how to record music and play it back, play games, and some of them even taught themselves how to speak English. So um, it's not that you need a whole class set of something, but rather sometimes few, fewer is better in that the kids will then self-teach and teach others. And on the next slide, you'll see a picture of me being taught by a student how to do dash. I um, had a lot harder time learning than um, the kids. They picked it up really quickly, but I kept bumping into the bookshelves with dash and, and having a hard time going in a straight line, but they were really, really patient. And um, all throughout this, I have to say, I am definitely not an expert when it comes to coding or robotics or any of these like electronic skills. And um, you don't need to be an expert. You just need to be willing to take and say, hey, does anyone know how to do this? Can somebody show me? And they'll go and they'll look and figure it out. They'll go on the internet. They'll teach each other. And they're just really wonderful. They're so patient um, with you as a teacher. Funding resources. Let's see. If you're lucky, you have a little teacher budget. I have a small teacher budget. Um, you have a building budget, and I have funded like my annual end of the year STEAM celebration with um, the building budget. Um, in, in some instances, I've been able to purchase like t-shirts for my student helpers um, because I have about 20 students who help me with the setup and um, breakdown of STEM. They buddy with the kindergartners and first graders in the afternoon and they um, help any of the volunteers that need help and just run errands and they're really great. Um, they will also help out with things. So the PTO, I actually do get a budget from them and that was the one I used on Makerspace this year, but you can also use them. Um, I went to their meeting and I got them after the first year when I've the first year I had my annual STEM, I only had 16 um, businesses and the three other specialists and myself, we each purchased some item for lunch thinking they would bring their own lunch and it was inhaled and I said, ooh, you know, next year we better take and accommodate some sort of bigger luncheon. And so um, I asked PTO for a budget for that and they gave me 200 and and then it gradually increased to 300 and this past year it was 500 for food um, because when you have 60 different businesses you figure at least two volunteers coming from each business and then some of those are clubs and if they're local clubs they can bring six to twelve people because they're doing different shifts so I figured anywhere from 120 to 150 people easily coming and eating um, but they're also great about taking in and getting the word out. They have a website um, and they'll announce it at meetings and put it in their notes. And and so I, when I've asked for donations, um, I've asked them for makerspace donations, maybe gently used items that um, their kids no longer use. And so they've been really good also about getting me those donations for my makerspace. 
the donations when um, I'm approaching businesses I tend to take and do most of my donation letters during the summer when I have the time to type them up and then or early fall and then I will call the business mail the letter out and then you have to call them to see when you can pick up the donation and then of course go pick it up so the community donations are a little bit more labor intensive I love to get them all done early in the year so that I don't have to take and go out and get supplies later on in the year I can just continue on with my teaching and know that I already have those waiting for the next activity um, I use the general template for my letter where I do the introduction I say um, who I am and what project I want to teach with what grade level and how many students it'll affect and then in the next paragraph I'm very specific about asking for the exact donations that I want um, and then the paragraph after that I include the the school district's tax ID number which you can get from your district office and um, thank them for their support and so uh, one thing to remember with the community donations is that their fiscal year is not the same as the school year and so sometimes if you get it out at the wrong time and they're kind of ending on this their fiscal year so they've run out of funds so don't take that as a no you just have to be aware that oh okay if you hit too close to November December you may have to go into the January and start again on that one mini grants uh, roughly 250 to 500 dollars um, the great thing about mini grants is if you've got a great idea and it's well written you usually will get it um, and there's not a whole lot of uh, work at the end as far as reporting to show evidence of how that grant improved your program um, the larger grants such as the Washington State Library digital literacy grant um, you have to take and take a lot more time to take and write the grant because it's a lot more specific in the details you have to have a very detailed um, idea and action plan with timeline of what's going to happen when and then you have to go and make a list of all the supplies and their prices um, and then if you're awarded the grant you work with the district office to take and make the purchases and th that grant had four quarterly reports and a summary um, but they could have fewer than that but it is a lot more effort to take and write and receive um, so if you have any questions regarding any of the programs or some programs you're thinking about or funding or you want to see some of my templates any questions whatsoever please feel free to contact me and I don't know um, I think at one time Jeremy said he was going to either put this in the chat my email or I don't know Jeremy how's that work uh, well the whole thing's gonna go up as an archive um, but yeah if people want it in the chat I'll type it out so I can they, they can just click the link oh can you hear me sorry it said zoom couldn't detect my oh talking. yeah I could hear you okay yeah it popped up the weird message there so okay I've typed it out into the chat it looks like it didn't make it oh there um, but at least you can copy and paste it uh, we do also have um, for those that have any questions if you go to the bottom of your screen there should be a Q and a Q and a module or a chat module go ahead and type out any questions you have in either one be more than happy to answer those great well I'm not seeing that at the bottom of my screen uh, I think it's, it's because you're sharing currently oh um, okay yeah we can leave this leave that uh, that one up for right now I don't see any questions coming up uh, but I can read them out when they if they okay I will say this, uh, our old software would tell us when somebody was typing, the new one doesn't. So it's a little hard to tell if anybody's typing or they're just waiting quietly for any questions. 
And I have to say that I have been really lucky to have a principal that has supported um, pretty much given me, you know, an okay on, on the programs that I've been eager to try. Um, and while I love doing the same program, it's really important to take and self-evaluate and think, is it still meeting the needs or is it kind of become taken for granted? You know, do you need to change it up? Do you have to do a different program? Are you reaching all the audiences you want? And so, although I started with the annual STEM, I'm, I'm glad that this year I got a chance to kind of back off and go to the easier ones that were less time consuming um, because I still hit the whole school, um, but it's at a different level. And so each one kind of has its pros and cons. Well, it doesn't look like anybody has any questions. I haven't seen anything pop up right now. So, Jane, thank you very much for, uh, first of all, playing guinea pig on our our new webinar software here and really helping us try it out and and sort out any bugs along the way. <laughs> You've been absolutely <laughs> just so patient with it. Um, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you very much for just joining us for First Tuesdays. It was, it was a wonderful presentation, wonderful to have you here. Uh, I look forward to seeing what else you come up with, honestly. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to give one more moment for questions, just in case, and then we can go ahead and wrap it up. I see some well, some thanks coming up in the chat. And thank you for attending and having me. Um, you know, like I say, there's a lot out there. The more you dig, the more you'll find out is open. It's just that it's not one of those things where they just kind of give you a flyer. Mm -hmm. So um, you can make some great community connections. Well, I'm hoping maybe we can get something over at the Oldie School District for my kids. <laughs> so uh, I, I know that they have some limited programs going on, but not a whole lot that I've been able to find so far. Well, the Barnes & Noble is great about coming in with their STEM, and they attended my events, and they brought their robotics and STEM activities. Okay. Um, and, of course, the public library is great about bringing their STEM activities, too. And mm -hmm. so you could get both of those in. <laughs> well, yeah, my daughter's starting a new school here, uh, just going into middle school. So I think I'm going to talk to them, see what they already have, and then maybe make those suggestions. Yeah. No, that, and that's, like I say, it's all free. And so they'll come in, you know, and... Um, you just say it's a guest speaker and, you know, get them going, you know. All right. Very cool. I'm sorry I'm making a note to myself here. All right. Uh, Wait, oh, there's there a, is question. a question. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. It's not, it looks like you've already noticed it, too. So it says, um, do you use mostly Pinterest to find STEM activities or other sites? Um, I use a lot of Pinterest um, for the STEM activities, and I, I did um, extensive, like with the hands-on is, is really what I did. But um, the reason I, I had the STEM was, uh, the Pinterest was just because they're fairly easy to put together without a whole lot of cost. And so um, great ideas. And um, you could probably even find my pins. Um, under my name, if you put in Jane Rizica, um, you can find my pins for for um, STEM boards that I've done and and added those in there. The, a lot of the STEM websites will have activities too, um, but I haven't used as many of those just because I typically will print off what I need and then give the kids the hands-on information rather than going to a website and having them research on that. Um, but I, th I think that Pinterest has a lot of ideas, you know, using popsicle sticks and everyday items, uh, Q-tips, uh, um, straws, toilet paper rolls, you know, so you can easily get a lot of these things um, made without a whole lot of funding. and. <laughs> So, so that comes in really handy.